All right. You, you gonna try to stand up? Sure. Okay. First thing first. Okay. You want you want to wave your hands up here? There you go. See what that horse is gonna do. Next thing, right leg. It goes right behind the saddle. Put your knee on it. Knee. There you go. That knee goes in the saddle. Yeah. And then this foot. This foot goes in the saddle. There you go. Eyes up. All right. Now stand up. There you go. Very good job. Very good job. <laughs> Never thought I would do that today. <laughs>
and he's a Tennessee Walker. He's um, 13 years old now, I believe. And um, when we got him, the person who was selling him was having a lot of trouble um, with finding him a new home because he's very like startly and, and jumpy and he has good days, he has bad days. Um, obviously new environments and stuff, he's definitely more, uh, you see it more. Anyways, but he, um, I've, I've been using him for trail riding and um, I'm I kind of, as we had discussed in that meeting, he's having issues with being able to canter. Um, he either runs through it if we're going in a straight line or he just like his legs literally go in all directions. Yes. Um, he has a little bit of barn sourness as well, but gating is kind of the, the main goal that I've been trying to work towards and he's definitely improved. But again, he it, it just seems like something that should be so natural for him is like yes. seriously difficult. But I also grew up eventing and hunter jumper. So I'm like totally new to gated horses. So, okay. Um, it's been about two years now, three years. But, so we're improving and working on it, but um, he's been a lot of fun, but he, he does have those quirks that are probably my fault. <laughs> no worries at all. So. All right, well, I'll take a little work with him if you want to get sure. yourself a seat. Yeah. I'm going to tell you guys a secret. The biggest limitation that a horse has is their rider, period. If we treat a horse differently because of their age, size, gender, color, well, they're going to act differently. Now, whose fault is that? Because they're different or because we're treating them different? One of the biggest things that you'll see is we take every horse for face value, and again, it doesn't matter what breed, what size, what age, we all treat them like the finished horse that we want them to become. If you treat them like the horse that they are, they'll forever be that horse. But if you treat them like the horse you want them to become, very quickly, you'll start seeing improvements. It's the same way we should treat people, but there's no help in that. But I can change the way that, that we treat horses. Guess where we're gonna start? Very right, very right. Every time that he would see anything, he would lock up his head and neck and try to take control. But what I want you guys to remember is it's not a horse's fear that hurts you, it's their reaction to that fear. So every time he would get afraid, he would try to take control of the situation, which made him dangerous. So once we got control of the head, we got control of the horse. Anybody that's ever been ran over by a horse in the history of horses, the horses respect whatever they were afraid of or, or anxious about more than they respected the person. The great thing about a sensitive horse is it's going to be very easy. If he's that respectful of everything, if I'm a bit assertive, it's going to be easy to make him respectful of me because I'm the only thing that's going to jump at him and chase him. One of the biggest misconceptions is when you have a horse that's sensitive or when you have a horse that's hot, that you have to tippy toe around them. If you're being careful around the horse, you're creating a horse that you will always have to be careful around. Let me say that one more time. If you're being careful around the horse, you're creating a horse that you'll always have to be careful around. The more spooky, the more sensitive a horse is, the more I'm gonna come to life. The more I'm gonna give him a reason to pay attention. Perfect. He passed kindergarten, he's very respectful. Do you notice that I carry the coils in the lead hand? I carry my coils, my extra up here. It's a, a real subtlety that nobody notices, but there's a reason for it. Everybody likes to carry all their junk in this back push hand. Come on, get away, get away. Theodore Roosevelt, my favorite president, Walk quietly, but carry a big stick. What I mean by that is, by putting the coals up front, I have fire in this hand. You don't want your horse to think that you're giving empty threats or promises. The reason they move off of the alpha mare whenever she flicks the ear, because they know she's not playing. Well, it's the same way. I point and I ask nicely. That time I didn't even touch him. I just waved this in the air a little bit, and he moved off of it. The reason he's moving off of it so lightly is because he knows that if he doesn't, I'm gonna put fire to him. Whenever you have a glob of rope back here that you're swinging, what are you gonna do with it? It doesn't have the same effect. Do you notice all Western wear has, has like these cute little tassels? Well, fringe was out in the 80s, okay? So this is here for a reason. It's for you to mean it when you say something. Excuse me, we're not, we don't weigh a thousand pounds like the horse does, so whenever we ask for something, excuse me, 
the next time you're gonna pop. So I'll ask, I'll point, you'll, you'll hear me give a verbal warning. They still don't move, I'm not gonna keep clicking like a, like a bubble. The next thing I'm gonna do is give a warning. One warning. No, the next time I'm gonna lay fire to them. It's a lot better to be stern and upfront one time than to have to constantly be nagging and bugging a horse. And nagging and bugging will get you in trouble. If you have to nag and bug your horse when nothing's going on, when something does go on, you're not gonna be able to stop the horse. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to first grade. I want you to notice something. A lot of times when people have a horse that's hot, they're scared to push them. They're, they're scared to put pressure on them. I'm here to tell you guys, pressure is not the issue, period. If because you put a leg or you put a kick or you put a spur or you pop them, if they're resistant, they're gonna do one of two things. If they're a hot horse, they're very likely to jump out of their skin. If they're a dull horse, they're very likely to sole up. Either one of these, sewing up and jumping out of their skin is not the issue. The fact that they're resisting you is the issue. The horse is sensitive enough to feel a fly land on his butt. So if I put pressure on his shoulder and he doesn't move over, he's just telling me right there that he doesn't respect me enough to move over. He's not sensitive enough. He's, he's too resistant. If the horse jumps out of his skin, that tells me again, it's not because the horse is too spooky, too hot, too sensitive. It means that he's resistant in his head. So whenever I touch him with one leg to ask him to step over and he just jumps forward because I touched him with a leg, that means I need more control of his head. We did a series of tests that we realized that he was disrespectful and that he was stiff in the head. And then we implied some exercises that help loosen him up, get control of that steering wheel, getting him soft and supple. Perfect. So he's moving off sensitive enough. I'm gonna ask him to drop his head for me. So you see, he's more sensitive. So you see it's harder for, for us to drop his head because he's full of that tight, nervous energy. Do you notice how right here I grab, I grab his nose band, I use two hands, I put my forearm on his forehead. That's because I don't want summer teeth. You know what summer teeth are? Some are here, some are there, some are dangling in your mouth. Yes. I appreciate you noticing. <laughs> I go to. It's so, not an excuse. I'm not saying it's an excuse. Now, but... <laughs> and people tell me, what kind of horse do you have? A rescue? No, no. What breed of horse do you have? A rescue? <laughs> Whenever it comes to, to left and right, you have to the groundwork. <laughs> so. <laughs> Java's kind of a Houdini. Um, he lets himself out of his stall quite a bit. Um, he will let himself out to go graze and um, while my off-track thoroughbred is in his stall just freaking out. So I think he enjoys doing that. Um, he's the dominant of the two, so he likes to, to play games. And um, yeah, he, he likes to open latches and the little snaps and everything. And, so it's always fun when you walk out to the barn and you think that you've got him all secure and then he's helped himself out. <laughs> we would act that way and then we feel bad. It's the whole not treating him as a pet sort of right. issue. But then also, but since also we last worked with you, um, I've been working a lot more to try and get control of his head that way. And um, so you're, that actually happened way faster than it did at the Southern Equine Expo when you did it. So Absolutely, I've seen you a lot more. Well, we passed kindergarten and first grade. Now we're gonna go to second. Start waving the rope. As soon as I can touch the, the air around him. Perfect, I'm gonna throw this up here. I'm gonna grab him by the flanks. He's gonna love that. That's just what we're looking for right there. Grab him by the back legs. It's very important whenever I do this that I don't give him enough line. I don't grab him back here because he can take a step forward and get me behind his hip. I want to make sure that if he takes off right now, I have him by the face. So even if he does take off hard, I pull him by the face just enough that his butt doesn't come in my direction. There we go. Let's 
so you have a horse that comes in that's so defined, he doesn't want you to touch his ears. It's, the great thing about this flag stick is it gives you an extra four feet of up, so I can touch his ears, I can put pressure on him. There's just no release for shaking your head. There's no release. There you go, you see him licking his lips, that's what we're looking for. So everybody talks about the left and right side of the horse. All prey animals almost have a 360 field of vision. All prey animals. But that almost will get you in a bind. That, that couple percent off will get you in a bind. So yes, they have left and right, but they also have above and below. And you wanna make sure to, you work both sides, but you also wanna work below them, just like that right there. Notice the distance that I have from him. So if he strikes out and tries to kill it, that's completely okay. So remember, four quadrants of their vision. Right, left, above, and below. It's so important that we desensitize this. Does anybody know any, any fragile cargo that might be up here? I don't want him to get spooked with something up here. If I sneeze, if I cough. Look how I don't shy from those violent reactions. Look how space really changes the, the whole concept of this. He's tough for his ears. You can't reach up to his ears fast. Well, it's real funny. When I have this space, all of a sudden I feel like Superman, and I can. Now, if I was doing that by hand, it would make it a lot more difficult to touch his ears like I wanted to. But very quickly, notice how horses only argue, horses only give you their opinion when they think it matters. When they think that this is some kind of discussion or debate. But as soon as you let them know, hey, what do you think, you're in a democracy? Okay, you can do it or you could do it. These are your options. They immediately stop arguing. Frantic plus frantic equals frantic. A lot of times, whenever things aren't going just the way we want them to go, we get too excited about it. We have to take our emotions out of it so that we can outthink the horse. As soon as you feel any emotion, you're losing. If you're mad, you're losing. If you're sad, you're losing. If you're frustrated, you're losing. If you're excited, you're losing. You have to be able to turn on and off the way that you want to. And as soon as the horse gets you emotional, you lose that ability. They'll stop trying to, to have a say about it. So I want, by the time that I reach up there with my hand, there we go, that was a better reaction there. That was a lot easier. Uh, Michael's actually worked with Java and I once before. It was back in um, March, I believe, at the Southern Equine Expo in Murfreesboro. And that's actually when I was first introduced to Michael. Um, so I was really pleased with what he was able to do there. Um, getting a tarp over his back was like the most astonishing thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> so um, that was, that, you know, obviously piqued my interest. So what am I looking for right here? Do you see how even with something scary on his back, he doesn't dare pull against my hand? That's just what I'm looking for. I'd much rather a chicken little of a horse that thinks the sky is falling, that's looking for my direction, than a brave horse that could care less about me. Because that brave horse that could care less about you, when they find that one thing that does bother them, and we all have that one thing, they're gonna take you. Where if you have that terrified horse that is constantly looking for your direction, you're their, you're their safety blanket. They feel comfortable with you. They're looking for you. They're looking for your instructions. It was really neat too, being able to, um, to work on the canter. And um, again, in the past, that's always been something that I feel like Java's really struggled with. 
So I'm riding gated horses like Icelandics that are five gated. They walk, trot, canter, uh, tolt, and pace. For them to have five gates and to be able to do all this stuff, they have to know exactly what they're doing. And the only way you can do that is if you make it black and white what you're asking of the horse. Horse like this, you get him gating. Obviously, he gates without problem. If I put him in frame to gate, and then from there ask him for more speed to canter, that's going to confuse him. Because now you can't ask for any more gate because he'll just start wanting to canter. So when I want to make the transition from gate to canter, I completely drop the reins, let him drop his head down, completely open the front door, and then I put fire behind him. In the beginning, he didn't know what to do with it. But kick, kick. Oh, you're not listening. Fakata! The next time I click, click, he's going somewhere. It's just like that. It's, it's just about being clear. So many times that you see people with these horrible aids, they're not the toughest people. They have these horrible aids because they don't have any real intention or commitment behind it. You know, what's the point of going and getting these things if you're not going to use them? You'll never see me, I don't wear spurs. You don't see me with a lot of stuff. You don't see me with a big bit. I'm gonna get that horse giving just with the halter because I have him giving, he understands what I'm asking. I'm not gonna have to get more aid than this lead rope right here because I'm gonna ask him nicely. I'm gonna give him one warning with my legs and I'm gonna give him fire. And just like from the ground, you'll see me get the laziest horse and all of a sudden they're not lazy. It's just because they understand my communication. Every time you think your horse is lazy, notice how quick they can move out of the alpha mare's way. I mean, they may run <laughs> way to the other end. Lazy is not your issue. Resistant, not being submissive, not having discipline, that's the problem. All right, guys, first things first, we get on, we stand still. See up, up here he's a uh... is there's two kinds of flexing. There's horsemanship flexing, which is you know blind, one-handed, just pull to the side until they get their head around. That's the concept. That's how you first teach a horse how to give their head. Once you get them more finished, finished flexing is using two hands. Again, horse trainers like to sound smart because they're uneducated. So they use words like vertical flexion. A vertical, this is not a science class, vertical flexion. What that really means is they have a flat face because if they flex like this with their nose out, they're really not giving, they're really not bending. The reason that finished horses have that nice headset is because they're really giving. And the reason that it's a desired headset is because it shows how trained the horse is. So now I use two hands and keep his head down in between. You see how his nose is pointed towards the ground instead of out in the air? That's more finished. You ask me what, the, what I do when the horse gets excited? That's what I do. Absolutely nothing. He was reacting, he wasn't giving, he was getting tense and tight. He's gonna find out that I'm the variable that doesn't change. There we go. So, but Michael, where's his release? Well, that's just the thing. When I'm flexing like this, all he has to do is give, and there's a release inside of my hands. There we go. So I want you to notice how this guy gates smooth as silk when he's soft and supple. Oh. What I mean by that is the second that he gets tense and tight here, that immediately translates to the ground and he gets rough. His gait gets rough. He gets pacey, he gets confused. The second he's submissive here, he gets soft here. The same thing happens on quarter horses. You'll ride a ranch horse, and I come from the land of the ranch horses. In my little bitty town with 2,000 people, we have two world championship roping families, if that tells you anything. What I'm saying is, you'll get some of these ranch horses and they will rattle your teeth out of your head trotting. But as soon as you get them soft, supple, collected, 
they're smooth and easy. So a lot of it's not if your horse gates good or doesn't gate good, it's rough or it's not rough. It's about if your horse is resistant or fluid. All right, young lady. If you want to come right out here and show these folks a little gate out in the open. That's it, sit back, look up. Forget everything you know about English riding. Push them forward. Perfect. Right, because he's not giving to you. There we go, again, again. Nice. I want you guys to notice how the horse giving and the horse being spooky go hand in hand. Spooky is not the issue. Resistant is the issue. When his head's down and he's soft and supple, that spookiness doesn't matter. It's only whenever his head's tight and tense and he's nervous that him spooking off the rail or jumping here or jumping here is a problem. It's not a horse's fear that hurts you. It's the reaction to that fear. That's it. Much better. Much better. You see him giving in the face now how he's flat. His nose is pointing towards the ground now. All right. Nice. Look at that stop right there. All right, would you like to loosen up on the rein, give him a, a lap canter? All right, so. Can he raise tighter because he might go around or just? What's he gonna do? You're gonna go with him, okay? Well, we're inside an arena. That's it, sit back, look up, loosen up your hips. That's it, perfect. If you want it to be slower, make the circle smaller. All right, circle to the left, circle to the left. Circle to the left, more left. There we go. There we go. Uh-uh-uh, break it back down and pick it back up. All right, break it back down. There we go. Nice, all right. Grab the reins, give them a stop. Nice, nice. Very good job. That's the first time we've really, he's fallen asleep. That's the first time we've really successfully had um, a good canter. So that's definitely exciting and something we'll be able to work on. All right guys, so a lot of times, whenever we first start getting a horse to canter, we're worried about leads, we're worried about speed, we're worried about surging. The first thing you have to do is get out of their way. Let them go somewhere. Whenever you let them go and you get out of their way, they're going to do what's the most comfortable for them. Yeah. So when you start turning, they're going to pick up their proper lead. They're going to they're gonna get balanced. They're going to get comfortable. Yeah. But if in the beginning you're already doing something that they're foreign to, that's uncomfortable for them, they don't understand how to do it with somebody on their back. And then on top of that, we start trying to hold and bend and, and force a lead and just let them go. Yeah. Okay. Once you have full control of their head, where you see it, they're soft and they're giving, you didn't, you didn't feel uncomfortable there going fast, no. Speed is not a problem. Speed without control is a problem. Speed without a steering wheel without brakes is a problem. But I, I'd much rather go fast on a horse that I have control of than to go slow on a horse that I have no control of. Initially, whenever you let any horse just go, they're going to surge, naturally. But very quickly, when they find out how much work it is, <laughs> they're going to want to go more control, more easy. But it's your job, and you did a great job of not freaking out and not grabbing on tense and tight. Very good job. <laughs> Now give her a round of applause, guys. That's some good riding right there. No, I did not expect that he would bring us out here and, and you know, really put it to work. So that was actually super helpful, and I'm glad that we had the chance to do it. And, um, and it, it definitely kind of helped me feel more confident with it. And because <laughs> my first question coming out was asking Michael, like, do I need to tighten my reins again? And which has been my, my problem from the get-go. So. Um, so for him to, to let me out here and say, no, keep your reins loose and, and give your horse the head, uh, that definitely helped me. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that, that was fun. Things that you would think that spooky horse that came into the round pit wouldn't be able to do, within 10, 15 minutes, we were able to really turn things around for him as soon as he realized, hey, we're the leader and we're gonna take care of you. Once he believed in our leadership and he had trust in us, it was very easy to make him a brave horse that would just put up with anything we, we asked him to do. This is what I want you to do with your horse at home. Be that cool, calm, confident leader that your horse can have faith in.
stay tuned to see the rest. So the big difference in the revolution that we're bringing to the horse industry is not wearing our horse out to get what we want. We use simplicity and communication to get everything that we want out of the horse. If you try to make the horse learn your language, you may have success, but you're gonna have to make every horse along the way speak your language. If you add a little pressure to yourself and you learn how to speak the language of the horse, then you can talk to any horse around the world. Anytime you get a chance, you should come down and see us. After you. All right, cowgirl. Would you like to introduce yourself, your horse, and what your equine goal is? I don't have the balance that I had or the confidence that I had to jump on and ride, so I'm here to make sure I can control her. We also do weddings at the house, and I want her to be able to be part of the weddings and hang out with the flower girl and whatever. So, there you Thank have it. Thank you, ma'am. I believe this is the first all-white Mustang that I've worked. All right. We're just gonna walk her off here, see where she's at. Aurora's a beautiful mare, the first all-white Mustang that I've ever worked, and I've got the opportunity to work several Mustang over the years. And she was held in captivity in Canyon City by the BLM. So there's 50,000 Mustangs out there, and they're constantly trying to adopt them out. So I learned about the Bureau of Land Management and the 100,000 wild horses we have and went to an adoption event in Knoxville, Tennessee. When Mustangs are gathered up, they're gathered up by helicopter. The Bureau of Land Management goes in on the different uh, HMAs, which is the areas where these wild horses run. I think there are seven across the United States. They round up the whole bunch. So her group was rounded up. She was a small baby, six month old beside her mother and she was pulled off and they freeze brand their neck and it tells the date they were harvested, uh, where they came from, and some other things in hieroglyphics. And she was returned, she was bypassed, nobody adopted her in adoption, and this was her third and her final strike uh, when I chose her out of the 125 horses. But I was just taking notes about the horses and what I was looking for out of the 125 wild horses was a horse that I felt was kind because I didn't know anything about training a wild horse. So I narrowed it down to one white horse, and she was being battered by everybody else. She was just a mess. Um, she was from Sweetwater, Wyoming, and she was placed at the penitentiary in Canyon City, Colorado. So she was there for at least five years. And when she was returned after being adopted the first time, she had to go back to Canyon City. And Canyon City is a big holding facility. So this is an undomesticated Mustang, and she was held in this captivity camp until she can get adopted out. Now, whenever they adopted her out, she got sent back for bad behavior. Well, once they either don't get adopted or they get sent back a couple times for bad behavior, they get to the point where they get a U. Whenever they get a U, that's unadoptable. You'll see it on their neck and it'll get stamped. So here's a horse from Sweetwater, Wyoming to a facility, a penitentiary, and there's 3,000 horses there. And they only have um, a few chances. So if they aren't adopted at each of these events, they go back forever, The three it's three strikes. Once they become considered unadoptable, they stop trying to adopt them out, and they are forever condemned to live in, in captivity in one of these centers. So I, this was her last time out, where nobody, if nobody adopted her, she would be sent to a facility forever. They brand a U on their neck, and they're not ever adoptable. I didn't know that, I know that now, um, that I was her last chance, but I will tell you that she is my last chance. One of my people that works at my ranch, Cedar Springs Ranch, actually had a huge bipolar episode while I was, while I was traveling. I traveled for business. And he called me and said, I need to go to the emergency room when you get home, where are you? I said, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, about three hours away. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I don't know, I just can't stop crying. This guy's six foot four. So I drove as fast as I could, and when I got there, I got him in the car, and we were headed to the emergency room because he was just sobbing, six foot four sobbing, and he said, stop at the house by the pasture and I was like oh my gosh if he runs there's nothing I can do. The horse had been there two weeks 
He walked out into the pasture. The wild horse came to him. He wrapped his arms around her neck and just sobbed into her mane, came back and got in the car and said, she saved my life. Every day when I thought about going out to the highway to go in front of a car, I had to pass her. And every day she came to me and let me wrap my arms around her. So an incredible horse. Um, I don't know who saved who, but it's going to be really important to see what Michael can do with her here um, because the fear is not her. The fear is me after all these years of not riding to know how to manage my fear and let this horse do what she wants to do. So that's why we're here. Stay tuned to see the rest. Hey guys, I'm Michael Gascon, the horse guru. Today we're here in Poplarville, Mississippi at the Gascon Horsemanship Ranch. Here in South Mississippi, it's always fair weather. It's always sunny and bright. We have over a thousand acres to ride on, just trails and obstacle courses, ponds to ride the horses through. Just an amazing place to be. Everybody has their niche. We have an amazing reining trainer, amazing trick trainer. We have an amazing Fasofino trainer, and the list goes on and on. And when you come here, it's just hard not to get swept up in the environment and the peace, love, and positivity that we have here on the ranch. We have a Western hotel. We have cabins, cowboy quarters, RV spots. People come and bunk with us and learn the knowledge that we've gained over five generations of horsemen. My mother was a horse trainer. She was the second youngest woman to ever win Congress in the 80s. And she was Miss Rodeo, North Carolina. And my father was a superstar Pasofino trainer, winning national championships and world championships back to back to back there were always problem horses in and around. So ever since passing it down to me, I decided that I didn't want to just be a regular horse trainer. I wanted to share our knowledge, our education, our history with the world so you can communicate easier with your horse. So the big difference in the revolution that we're bringing to the horse industry is not wearing our horse out to get what we want. We use simplicity and communication to get everything that we want out of the horse. And we'll work 10 to a dozen horses a day. And not only do we work 10 to a dozen horses a day, there'll be 10 to 12 different breeds a day. And those 10 different horses are all gonna progress, all gonna play soccer, all gonna do obstacles, all gonna do things that their owners thought impossible the day before. People say, how can one person work so many different breeds? It's because we're speaking the language of the horse. If you try to make the horse learn your language, you may have success, but you're gonna have to make every horse along the way speak your language. If you add a little pressure to yourself and you learn how to speak the language of the horse, then you could talk to any horse around the world. Miss Shirley is very green in riding, doesn't have a lot of experience, and she wants to make sure that this Mustang is gonna be the right fit for her. So she wants us to evaluate her and see what we think. Perfect, we'll drop this down a little bit. So people ask me all the time, hey Michael, where do you put the halter at? Well, between the nostrils and the eye, midway is a good starting point. But if your horse is being stiff, where do they lead a 2,500 pound bull from? From the nose, right? So the lower we bring it, the more leverage we're gonna have and the more sensitive they're gonna be. And then the better they are, we can pick the halter back up. But Michael, Google says we'll break their nose. Google says a lot of things. In all my, in all my years working with horses, I've never seen a horse injured with a halter, period. For you to break something, pop something, you have to have either some kind of leverage or shanks or, so you know you have the bridleless bits, but they have shanks on them with a chain, then yes, you could put that too low and I guess if you get in a horrible situation or you pull, none of you ladies have anything to worry about. No matter how much strength or you try, nothing you're gonna do with that halter is gonna injure that horse. And we can tell from the beginning that she must be the alpha in the herd because she's not scared or spooked by much. Perfect. Just like that, she passes kindergarten. Kindergarten is respect. To pass kindergarten is simple. All you have to do is stay out of our bubble. Our bubbles are arms reach. This is very common for horses. They already understand the alpha mare. However far she can reach you, that's her bubble. Stay out of it, unless she invites you in. Well, it's the same way with us. If that horse is always outside of our bubble, when's the last time you got hurt by a horse going away from you? Oh, that's right, you've never been hurt by a horse going away from you. It's always when they make contact that you get broken up. So that space is your safety. But guys, all of us live in real life, and in real life, shit happens. 
It's that simple. If you have no space between you and your horse and your horse gets spooked, they're gonna end up on top of you. If you keep them out there, now this horse has all this space and opportunity to go somewhere else if they get spooked or, or they have a problem. So start gaining that space between you and them. I'm kind of an alternative person, whether it comes to medicine or whatever, and the minute I saw Michael in action, I understood this is a totally different way from, from grandfather to great-grandfather to, to Michael to train and think about horses. And that's why I'm here. I would have never gone to another clinic with any of the big names. Um, I, just, I sincerely believe this is something entirely different and it resonates. It's like that light bulb that went off the minute I saw what they did and said, this is it, this is where I want to bring this horse, so. The next thing we're gonna do is ask her to move off. So a lot of people don't want to put pressure on undomesticated Mustangs. Imagine having a vehicle that you were scared to press the gas on. I don't care how hot, how sensitive, it doesn't have to be a cold horse for me to put pressure. One more time, if I can't push their buttons, I have no business riding. Pressure isn't your problem, it's their reaction to that pressure. If you swing this rope and she gets mad and starts attacking you, well you don't need to ride that horse anyway. Because there's going to be some day that you're going to be crossing a road, you're going to be in traffic, you're going to have a turkey pop out of the bush, and you're going to need that horse to react in a stressful situation. If they can't handle a little pressure, that's not a good horse for you to be on. Very nice. So we're just waiting here for her to drop her head and get off my pressure. So you never want to be stereotypical, right? But a lot of stereotypes are for a reason because there's some truth in them. That's how stereotypes begin, right? I want you to look at her size, her build. A lot of time it's the mare that's built like this, that's the boss, that's the leader, that's the alpha. Not that that means any difference to you, but just know that a lot of time that horse you're gonna to have to be a little bit more stubborn with because she, if she's the alpha mare, she's not ready to give up her, her leadership status so easily. Isn't she built a lot like the gelding that we worked yesterday that was so tough? She passed kindergarten and first grade. So now we're going to move off to second grade, which is desensitizing. Just want to be able to move this rope around her. As soon as we can touch the air around her, we're going to throw this up on her back. So I just want to be touching her, touching her, even though she is not okay with this. That's fine by me. So odd. Most people, when they bring me a rope, they bring it too short. It's nice to have too long of a rope. So right here, I'm touching her flanks and she's not okay with that. That doesn't mean that I stop. She reacts, she acts like she's uncomfortable. That doesn't mean that I stop. You see this hand hanging up in the air? So if she runs my way or tries to throw a strike or a bite, I can just stiff arm right here. Your stiff arm is something that you want to develop. You want to develop a stiff arm for this reason. I've had big horses that try to run me smack dab over. If you have a good stiff arm, if your arms are just, you've already just got accustomed to putting that arm out in front of you, if you lock this hand out, more, most horses are gonna feel that hand and move away from it and not run you over. And if you get that horse that's just hell bent on running you over, if I stiff arm here and she still tries to run me over, she's gonna push my body one step out of harm's way. I've had this arm right here and this arm right here save my life again and again. Working a big draft, working a big Clydesdale, working a big warm blood working a feisty pony. That shit's dead set, I'm gonna run you smack dab over. Boom, I put a stiff arm on them. I'm not strong enough to stop them, but they're strong enough to push me one step out of the way. And that keeps me from getting broken bones and getting hurt. So develop your stiff arm. I don't feel like I have the skill set to take her where she needs to be. She has a great home, she has all the feed she could need, she's kind, people love on her, but I want her to be able to do what she came to do and you can tell when the others go out, to, the other horses go out to ride, she kind of says, I think I can do that. I can just see her head spinning and so this is her chance to get to be all the horse she can be and I'm going to let Michael, I'm going to let her tell Michael what it is she needs from me and that's why we're here is kind of unlock her secrets of what she really needs.
Now remember, the undomesticated horses, they have a little bit more flight in them, a little bit more fight in them, because they had to live on their own. That's okay. There's no reason to treat them any different. Everybody talks about the left and right, but they're still left, right, above and below. When you start treating them any different, you're gonna get a different horse. Don't you want that perfect horse, that horse that you could be safe riding? So just because they're Arabian, or they're a Mustang, or they're a hot horse, or they're reactive, you better treat them the same, you better do the same steps. A 13 year old boy at a middle school dance, things are gonna go bad for you. <laughs> things are smooth and easy and graceful like a ballerina. You're gonna have a good day. But if things are, are herky-jerky, it's because they're still reactive. They're not thinking, they're, they're herky-jerky, hopping and bopping. They're just reacting to the things that are going on. That's not what you're looking for. Another eye over here. I also want to activate that eye with my hand. I don't want my leg to be the first thing that she reacts from. I want to let her know that I'm coming. Bring my leg over. already had been started a bit and very green in riding but does have some experience. Whenever it came to the walk trot canter, she could tell you she was experienced because she would drop her head and relax. But whenever we started doing obstacles or play soccer or the tarp, she would tell us that she was uneasy with that by picking her head up, getting stiff, tense and tight and making these faces like this with her eyes open and looking like she's ready to explode. And it was our job to get in there and show her, hey, it doesn't matter what we ask you, you don't have to have ever seen it before, just have faith in us and we'll take you to the promised land. We'll keep you safe. Look. All right, young lady. I'm going to over there. Whenever I turn, watch my leg. Just half, 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 half. Please. Watch this leg over here. When I do that roll back, I look. Leg. Half, 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 half. Very quickly, she's going to start listening to that leg. Bring the reins to you. Pull around. 
You see how I didn't leave my command post? I didn't reach down. Don't, don't come here to get your one right stop. Develop good muscle memory. When it hits the fan and things get, life hits you, you're gonna do what, what you've been practicing. You're gonna do, muscle memory is gonna take over, your reaction is gonna take over. Make this be your reaction. You don't want your reaction to leave your seat. This is your command post back here. See how you sit back? The horse doesn't have to get used to it or been at it. Gives them their face. So even if she does surge, she's not going to surge into my hand. If you get a weapon look like this, that's kind of bulky. If they surge and you pull back with two hands, you're very likely to run to a buck. See that prey drop come to life. It was the same thing here. She was terrified of the ball until the first time that it went away from her. As soon as it ran from her, it went away from her. Oh, I got this. 24 months of taming her and gentling her, I was still too afraid to ride her. Um, even though I would saddle her and bridle her and lunge her. She's very kind, but I can tell she just puts up with me. She's So she truly isn't, as Michael would say, um, she does, she, she's not mean to me because she's just such a kind horse, but it's really clear that she doesn't know how to bend for me and how to, I, I'm afraid to can her. I don't really have to touch her face. Once we are able to ride the horse, do obstacles, stop good, put a nice sliding stop on her, then we got Miss Shirley on her and we linked them up. Um, the rollback was cool because I've never done that and uh, now I know that at home in pasture or whatever I know exactly what to do but that look over the shoulder and work with that outside leg, that leg away um, was really strong. I felt much more powerful. Right, 
straightforward way to get a great handle on the horse. People want that responsive handle. They get the horse more or less going left and right. But if you like that western handle where the horse just jumps to, to the cue to where you're asking, by putting that fence in, you're really giving them a repercussion if they don't listen. So they really speed up the process of getting where you want to go. All right, I'll try it off. Hand down right there. That's it. Once they started riding, and I knew what the horse was capable of, it's my job to make sure that the rider is pressing the same buttons. So we got her sitting back a little bit more on her pockets, we got her giving crystal clear communication to the horse, not asking the horse to go faster and pulling her in the face at the same time. Sit back, you don't have to help us. Get the we can help you. Stand there. Sit back, push, kick, kick, kick. Don't stop hitting until she goes. It was all scary. I was shaking all over because, again, I don't feel like I have a very strong seat. I'm not as strong as I was when I was a little kid and could just hop on anything and ride off bareback. Uh, now I have to think about it and am I going to stay on or am I going to fall off? And so that's one of the reasons that it's hard for her to lope. She does want to take care of me and so she wasn't sure about cantering. She's like, I'm not sure she's steady up there. Uh, so she's actually responding to the, oh my god, she's going to fall off if I can or I don't want to hurt her because you can tell she really does care. She's a really caring horse. Hey, 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 hey. totally excited and I realized that I have all the pieces of a round pen just like that in my back pasture unused so the first thing I'm going to do is drag those out probably when I get home and put a round pen just like that up because she's just been working out over our 20 acres and now I want to control it more so I, I can push her harder and know that she's not going to take off so round pen up and we're getting on the minute we get home <laughs> so it's all good. All people want to sit too far forward and grab too much reins. So once we got her to, to give the horse her face and sit back on her pockets, the horse was happy to walk, trot, canter, do rollbacks, do stops, play soccer, go over the tarps. When you're working with great horses or horses that you're trying to get them to do the right thing, you don't want to help them. It's our natural instinct to canter, run, go forward. And we leave our command post, we leave our, our balance, we leave our safe zone to try to help them and canter for them with our hips. She is a very big girl. Sit back here and you can you ask the horse canners for you, she takes you instead of you trying to take her, it makes it a lot easier for her. A lot better job in the face. Sometimes when we have the horse in frame, we ask the horse to canner, but then we touch him in the face at the same time. So we're pressing the gas with one foot and we're pressing the brakes with the other foot. Right? We're asking him to go, but we're touching him in the face. Obviously, she loves the word low. Stop is her favorite speed, which is great. That means we'll get a nice Nice good slide out of her. Nice good rollbacks out of her. But for that camera to get her soft and easier moving, work on sitting back and letting her take you. You know, sometimes when you imagine you'll never, ever do something again, like that was the last time I did it when I was this age, and then suddenly, either in your craziness at old age or in your bravery, you remember that piece of yourself and you want to get it back. 
that's where I was out there. It's, oh my gosh, this whole experience has been like that. It's the magic of getting it back, and I feel like I'm right back in touch with my inner child, and she's going, all right. So that's how it felt out there, was that inner child was going, let's get this on. <laughs> so take off 20, 30 years, and woohoo. <laughs> Remember, there's nothing natural about natural horsemanship. Out there in the Sahara, you don't see lions riding the back of a zebra. So everything about horsemanship is learned. And like my grandpappy used to say, brain surgery is easy if you know how. So we're just pointing out some natural mistakes that she's making, and I think they're going to be a good match.